Hi, and welcome to In The Zone. I'm the host, Ethan Moore. This show is meant to be a space for long form conversations with various members of the baseball world. In this conversation, I go in the zone with Kyle Bodie. He's the founder of Driveline Baseball, a training facility in Kent, Washington that is changing baseball player development as we know it. He is also the director of pitching with the Cincinnati Reds. In November, the Society for American Baseball Research named Kyle one of the 50 most influential off-field figures of the last 50 years of baseball. Our conversation covered how Kyle's unique experiences shaped him into who he is today, the core tenets of the Reds pitching philosophy, and much more. Questions are marked on the video and timestamped in the description for your convenience. Enjoy our conversation. Sweet. All right, well, my first question for you is, um, what are the pros and cons of being a coach in pro ball versus being a coach at driveline? Yeah, the pros are uh, you get to work with them. Um, you know, they're your, you're, they're, they're your athletes, right? Then you own it from the top to the bottom, which is pretty cool. Uh, and not that not something you get to do all the time, you know. Um, so it's pretty sweet. Um, you know, you control like their scheduling and how they do things, so not just like you train them, but you're also their, their coordinator, right? And how they, and they coach and all that, you know, so that that's pretty sweet. Um, it, it's really exciting to watch, really rewarding. You know, you know, it's going to be a multi-year commitment. Um, and so you can kind of plan for three years down the road, which is awesome, which is not always the case at driveline. You know, you try to set it up, you know, um, and so then that's kind of a big, um, not an issue, but it's just, it's a thing at driveline, you know, it's a, uh, they go away, they leave the nest, you know? And so, and then it happens to pro ball too, but you know, it's like you, you have less direct control. Right. And so that can be a thing. Um, the other pros of it, uh, you know, and the cons of it are, uh, it's just such a logistical crazy nightmare. You know, it's like, it's crazy to get 180, you know, people, uh, you have 110 pitchers or something like that, you know, and you're trying to schedule bullpen times and everything in the same complex and you have to negotiate, you know, not only your employees, but like the support staff, and how do you do things? And how do you set standards? And, and that was really what I did in the first year is a lot of logistics. And I, I knew that going in, but it was even more than I thought. So it's, if it's not, if you're going to, if you're going into professional baseball and you're a coordinator, I'd like, you think you're going to coach, like that's all you're going to do. It's probably going to be the, the thing you do the least. Um, assuming you're with an organization like the Reds, which has a very traditional structure, right? Where it has one or two coordinators, like a pitching coordinator and assistant, which was me and Eric Jagers. And then it has, you know, and then uh, the director of pitching was also the assistant to pitching coach in the big leagues. You know, and now I'm the director and we have one coordinator. You know, some clubs have six coordinators or even eight or something like that. And, you know, it just uh, it doesn't, that has never really made sense to me. You know, that, you know, I don't, it just, it's tough because how do you set standards? You know, the coordinators are above the coaches, but are they special treatment? You know, do they do, I just, I never really, um, I don't know. Maybe it's just owing to being in startups and a driveline and all that. I'd rather have a smaller, more efficient staff. Uh, and then we have clear expectations and then everyone knows who to go to. Um, and it's just kind of my opinion. So, you know, when you're the coordinator, you do the logistics and all that and you set the standards and you build the systems and you don't coach that much and you got to be okay with that, you know, and that's um, something I've, I've embraced over the last four years of driveline. So, it wasn't that big of a it wasn't that big of a shock, uh, but uh, the amount of the logistics was larger than I thought. So I guess that was a surprise. Do you think that you have to be a good coach or have a lot of coaching experience to be a good coordinator or director? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think in a system where you have a lot of coordinators, maybe not. Um, but I think if it's a traditional setup. Yeah. I think you had to have coached a little bit, you know, not necessarily professional baseball. You know, I've worked in pro ball for eight years now, uh, seven before I took the full-time job. So I had experience in scouting and coaching, uh, doing contract work, but I think most people would agree that that's not the same as being a pro coach. Um, but you know, at driveline, I had a lot of experience, obviously thousands of pitchers come through here. So, um, you need to be able to identify. It's not that you have to be the most technically skilled coach. Um, you know, I'm not. You know, Eric Jagers was. Now that he's on the big league staff, uh, I'm probably still not the most technically skilled coach uh, on our staff. Um, so that's okay. But you got to be able to relate to him. You know, you got to be able to. You got to be able to be in their shoes, in my opinion. So it, it definitely. I wouldn't say it's a hard and fast rule that you have to have coached or be a good one, but I think it's. Uh, I think it really helps. Okay. Can you describe or kind of distill down the Reds pitching philosophy from an organizational perspective? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, the three pillars we believe in, and there's a lot of organizations that have like their mission statement. Um, 
but we really believe in it. You know, it's uh, it's called ACR. It's like we're very authentic, uh, connected, and relentless. And so I was just talking to a player, um, Case Williams. We traded for him uh, this year, a high school player. Uh, and uh, in the Jeff Hoffman trade, he was he was part of that. And so Case, I, I called him, and you know we've been talking to him, talked to him a couple times, talked to our coaches, just kind of set because it's crazy for him. He got drafted, and then he got traded. Right, and barely barely was catching on with the Rockies, and then he got traded. So it's just like yeah. you know trying to trying to see it from his point of view how how, how different it's been, you know. And so for Case, uh, just to be like, hey, like this is what we this is what we expect. Here's how we do things. So authentic is like, look, Case, you, you can always tell me the truth, man. Like if you know who I am, you Googled my name, you know anything about me, or as you get to know me, you could just say like, hey, Kyle, like what you told me that I don't believe that makes no sense. You know, I don't, I don't got it that way. I'm not going to take offense, you know. Uh, hopefully it doesn't come up. Hopefully we don't get that blunt, you know, um, but hopefully it's uh, a little bit more productive conversation. Like, hey, you know, like, Kyle, uh, I don't really understand that, you know, uh, but like, you know, I think what we have to understand as a coach or a coordinator is you're not entitled to a kid being respectful to you. You're not entitled to that. You know, at Driveline, you know, they pay. It's a little bit of a different relationship. You know, they select the organization. They select Driveline. They want to go there. They know what they're getting into. In professional baseball, that's not the case, you know, so you're not entitled to their respect. It's just, it's just how it is, you know, and that's not good or bad. Kids today are more anti-authoritarian than they ever have been. Uh, they, they come up questioning. They came up in the age of Google, you know, um, I didn't, you know, like that wasn't that, you know, by the time I'm 37, which basically makes me a senior citizen when it comes to technology, you know, and uh, like just being able to Google things wasn't really a thing until like college, you know, and even then it was like still like pretty new. You know, I took a tour of Google, you know, in 2001, and it was like still a really small company, you know, and so you, today we take it for granted, which, and you have the sum total of human knowledge in your pocket on your iPhone, your Android, you know, and that's, that's a beautiful thing, but then it causes people to look things up and Google it and question, you know, and that's a good thing, um, in my opinion, um, you know, so that you, they're always going to fact check you, they're always going to bring ideas to the table, and they don't just believe what you have to say, and it's not you, it's nothing against you, to get it's because they, they do that with their teachers they do that with their parents and they do that with with each other and that's um that's how it is some people can take it as a sign of disrespect i don't feel that way I, i'm not entitled to anything i'm not entitled to your attention i'm not entitled to your respect i gotta earn it that's how i feel um and that's part of being authentic it's about being straight with the person you know we have standards with the reds like we have key performance indicators and metrics, you know, like to pitch in the big leagues. These are the things we believe in, you know, can't really get into the details of it, but like, it's no secret. To look at our big league roster, what we like, right? Like there's a reason that Lucas Sims is our, you know, most trusted reliever in, in big situations, right? He's one of the, one of the very few, you know, um, like that, that we trust in any situation, right? <clears throat> there's a reason, you know, that Trevor Bauer was so successful here, you know, because not only was he willing you know, to do what Bauer always does, right? But there was an environment where he was supported, right? A pitching coach that understood what he was trying to say, an assistant pitching coach that got it, a director of pitching initiatives that was with him, um, you know, and he was a great leader, right? And, and if you know Trevor, he's very authentic. <laughs> he's going to tell you exactly what's up, you know? And he, you know, so that, that was awesome, you know? And, and to show that from the top down uh, was great, you know? And then there's the connected part. And I said, you know, I said a case today. I said, you're, you're never going to over-communicate. You're never going to bother me. You're never going to bother a coach. You know, like if you think you're talking too much to someone, you know, you're not, you know, we need to stand that. Like, that's the thing I pride myself the most with the Reds. Um, and I think our organization does in general is that like, we're not going to be the smartest. We don't have the most money. Our ownership group is, you know, like, you know, doesn't, we don't have the billions and billions of dollars. We just don't. Right. And so we can sit here and complain about it, or we can figure out how to, how to be good within the confines of what we have. Um, and I, like I said, I like that. That's what I wanted. You know, um, I, I want that responsibility and I want to pass that on. So the connectedness is important. We need to be able to communicate. Uh, if we grow the organization too large and we rely on too many people, then the communication becomes exponentially more difficult. There's a great book called the Myth mythical man month that you can read on this topic. It was published decades ago about how the 1980s, I believe about how adding more people to an organization, uh, only linearly improves uh, the performance of the organization and the output, but exponentially increases the communication difficulty of the organization, right? And so like, as you add more people, you get to like Dunbar's number where you don't know everyone's name, you know, and then at some point, like, you know, you just reach a technical complexity 
Now, those things have been mitigated somewhat with like Slack, Basecamp, and Zoom, and things like that that allow you to communicate a little more effectively. But the principles still hold pretty true. You know that it's really difficult to communicate when a large organization and uh, know what everyone is doing. You know, and have an effective management structure. So. Being connected is probably the number one thing we care about most. You know, it's right up there with authentic. And then uh, relentless is the last part, which is uh, Jay Laranaga of the, of the Boston Celtics. I'm wearing a Celtics shirt under this. I'm certainly no Boston fan, but I am a fan of Laranaga and Danny Ainge and those guys and Brad Stevens. And Laranaga, he's the assistant uh, coach of the Celtics. He's the head assistant. And he said uh, about a player, you know, he said, we can get in fights. You know, constantly we were battling, you know, here or there. But he knows that tomorrow I'm coming into work, you know, and I'm going to we're going to work. I'm going to go to work with him. I don't hold anything against him. Um, and I hope he does the same, you know, like we can yell at each other. And uh, the next day we both go to work, you know, and that's that's being relentless. You know, that's not doubting your ability. You know, that's that's training with a purpose every single day in this during this covid layoff period. We stayed on the players really regularly. It was a blessing from the front office and the ownership to pay the employees the entire time. There were no layoffs. Uh, no furloughs, you know, on the player development side, which you can't say that about a lot of organizations. A lot of organizations worth many times what the Reds are worth were furloughing coaches, you know, and so really, really, really blessed for that to not have happened to us. You know, some of us had to take a pay cut. I did. It is what it is, you know, but like we were, you know, we kept going to work, you know, and so that it's going to really pay dividends down the road with our players, not only from the performance, but the trust that, you know, hopefully we've earned a little bit um, through that. And so then that's, that's the, those are the overarching philosophies of the Reds in general, you know, and I'll try to be brief on the pitching side. I mean, like, I really believe in those on the pitching side as well. Um, more specifically on the technical side, it's like, look, you know, we have to present the best information to the players in the way they best understand it. Like just, that's all there is to it. You know, like we can't give them raw track man files. We can't give them summary game summaries without explaining it. If you don't understand it, you can't explain the intricacies of it. You can't show it to the player. It's, it's just not okay. You know, if the player – and the player's going to question you. He's going to go on brooksbaseball.com. He's going to go to driveline. He's going to go to baseball prospectus. He's going to read stuff. He's going to read Bart Smith stuff, Dr. Alan Nathan, Mike Fast blogs, yours, you know, Ethan Moore. He's going to read – he's going to read, you know. Um, and you got to pretend like everyone's going to do it, right? And so they're going to question you on this, everything you know. And you don't need to know it right then, but you do need to be able to say, I don't know, I'm going to look into it and humble yourself and then actually research and follow up within a few days, you know? Um, and then you're going to work with players who don't want to see it. And you're going to work with players who don't have the highest education, whether it's high school in the, you know, in an area where they, they knew they were going to be drafted and they didn't focus a ton on their education down to Latin American players who speak English as a second, as a, you know, as a second language. Uh, and they haven't necessarily had advanced uh, secondary or post-secondary education. Um, and so how do you make it real for them? How do you make it applicable? You know, how do you not just show them that you're smart? How do you show them that you're invested in their career? You know, and this is, this is what we would like to happen. Um, and then we got to do that. And we got to do that all the time. And we got to be there. Uh, I'm really big on, the last thing I'll mention here is that I'm really big on uh, not abusing our video and tech interns. I hate it. I hate seeing it. It's gone on too long in professional baseball. It's gone on too long at companies like Driveline. You know, everyone at Driveline works exceptionally hard from the interns to the CEO to the founder. You know, um, we just work our asses off and we lead by example, you know, and then we're going to do that with the Reds. You know, like our coaches, we're not going home, you know, at 2 p.m. in spring training. We don't do that. You know, we, we educate. We do continue education. We have classes. We do presentations. You know, we, we help the scouts. We write reports. You know, we did a ton of work on the Rule 5 drafts. Not a lot of organizations where the coaches are writing reports on the Rule 5 draft and going in deep on the TrackMan info, but we are, you know, because that's we're going to support our other departments. Uh, we are not going to make video interns set out the rap soda and the edutronic. It's not that hard, fellas. Like, we know you, you can set up the rap soda. Let's put some marks on the ground, put a flag on the ground. You set it here. Here's how it is. Now it's up to me to develop the training materials for that. It's got to be foolproof. I'm going to have videos in English and Spanish. I'm going to have written directions in English and Spanish. And it's going to be bullet bullet points. If you have any issues, here's who you contact and here's how we do it. You know, that's how we do things, but we can do our own work. You know, like we can, we can make our bed, we can wash the car, you know, we can do those things. Like we don't, you know, like that, that's, we owe it to our pitchers to do the little things. We sweep the sheds, you know, at the end of the game in instructs, you know, we had the pitchers, sweep the bullpens, you know, Hey, get in here, the pitchers and the coaches and the coaches do one last walkthrough, pick up all the trash, throw it out, make sure, you know, it's cause the grounds crew, 
they, they work their asses off, you know, like we're, and, and I'm not saying I'm the best mound tamper or whatever, uh, but we're going to, we're going to do our best to get it in a shape where the ground screw can do half the job, you know, and uh, you know, we can, we can do it. And that's what I believe in. Like, that's probably the number one thing I care most about uh, is just giving uncommon effort because not only do we need to, because we don't have a million coaches and coordinators, uh, but we also have um, it's good. It just shows the players that it really matters. And it also prepares my coaches to become coordinators when they get interviews um, that they have done it all, you know, and I'm, I'm proud of that. That's, that, that. that's what we've done at driveline. I'm proud of that. It's what we're doing with the reds. And I'm proud of that too. Yeah. Well, that was a, a very, um, very valuable answer. So thank you very much um, for, for diving deep on your philosophy there. I can tell that culture is something that's really important for you. That, answer focused a lot on um, the culture of the Reds and, and the pitching side of the Reds. And not coincidentally, Driveline, your company is known for uh, its kind of unique culture. Would you mind kind of characterizing the Driveline culture? And is it similar or different from the Reds culture now? Yeah, it, it's similar. You know, I was talking to my partner, Mike, about this today. You know, there, there's a uh, there's kind of a movement inside professional baseball. There has been for years, you know, like, oh man, we need to get more data-driven coaches and we need to get more educated, you know, like we need to get smarter. We need to get, you know, we need to bring some fresh people in, you know, we need to get, we need to get, uh, we need to get new people, new blood in here. And we need to change things up. You know, it's like, yeah, it's true. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? And then a lot of teams will come <clears throat> and they'll visit driveline and they'll be like, man, like, look at this, look what's going on here. What do they notice? They notice the culture. They notice the intensity. They notice the fact that the athletes are very autonomous, that they know what they have to do. They're not being you know, like told what to do. You know, they do their thing. They own their training and they check in with the coaches, you know, periodically to make sure they're on the right track, to get feedback, to guide their training, you know? And so my fear is that a lot of organizations and people see that and they're just like, Oh, I got it. You know, we get the best stuff, the best technology and, here's how we do things and, and whatever. And then we get young kids to come in here and then that's it. You know, they know the things that we set them up. It's like, man, you know, the amount of training that we put into our interns over the first year that they're here is, is, is crazy. You know, and that, that was the certification courses that we sell. You know, they didn't start off as a product. It wasn't, we were never thinking about selling it. That wasn't the point. The point was to develop a comprehensive training program to get our interns up to speed because like we're losing interns left and right to pro ball left, you know, like everyone we've lost, I think like 25 last count, 25 to 28 uh, people have worked for driveline that have, have gone on to work in professional baseball, you know, and that's not even counting the split deal employees like myself. So, you know, and that, I'm proud of that, you know, but at the end of the day, like we need to be able to train uh, people. And uh, sometimes that goes, that gets, that goes missing. You know, because some of the most valuable things in my life in pro ball were, were being a pro scout, going on the road, scouting, <coughs> scouting, doing video internship stuff, like doing a lot of um, technical work uh, that really brought me along and just being around the game. You know, and if you don't bring along your interns, you don't invest in their education, you don't invest in them, not even money, just time. If you don't invest time and help bring them along, it's not going to work. You know, if you bring a big tent, I, I like to say, if you have a big tent approach where you bring in all these different viewpoints and it's going to be this beautiful thing where there's a bunch of, you know, disagree and commit and everyone comes in. It's like, you know, what you end up with is a circus, you know, like you need a ringleader that actually like, this is the time this is going to happen. And this is how we're going to do things. And this is how, well, this is what it means to be a red. And this is what it means to be a coach with the reds. And this is what you have to do. And these are what we expect. And you have to hold people to those expectations and then let the people hold you accountable to those expectations. And, you know, I think it gets missed. It's tough, you know? So like, that's the biggest thing that I think uh, defines who we are at Driveline and the culture and how it got to where it is. Very cool. That kind of touches on the, your idea that you wrote about in your blog about the criticism waterfall, which is that you, shouldn't be getting as many opinions as you can before making a decision because you're never going to be able to please everyone, right? So you should instead just make your decisions based on first principles. But um, when you're deciding or when you're making a decision, who do you kind of let in to be kind of an advisor or kind of a check on your thinking? And, you know, how do you figure out if someone is just kind of contributing to the noise and, and block those people out? Yeah, it's interesting. <clears throat> you know, I think I wrote, I'm pretty sure I wrote that blog post before I read Ray Dalio's principles, which is funny because it's kind of the same thing he says. Uh, so uh, we both independently discovered it. Ray's a lot more successful than me, uh, but uh, you know he he puts it a lot better. You know, the, and there's the blog, but it's still on my site. I, I still stand by it. 
you know, but it's about the believability weighted index, right? Like you need to know, like, what is this person historically, what have these people historically been right about in the past? You know, what are they weighted, you know, like you can tell me anything. Like that's, that's the beautiful thing. I'll take opinions from literally anyone on any topic, you know, but you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to weight them all equally. Right. And so then that's kind of what Ray said, which was much more succinct and made more sense than what I wrote, you know, which is uh, what I was trying to get at is that people, when faced with a difficult decision, think that getting the most advice from the most amount of people and then synthesizing it into a decision is the correct uh, move. Um, and then that's really just a misunderstanding of what Sura Wiki wrote in The Wisdom of Crowds. You know, it's just like, you know, it's just like, guess the number of uh, marbles in a jar, right? The jar is huge. And then no one answer will probably be correct. But then when you average it and then throw out the outliers, like the average is extremely close to the real answer, right? Then that's the wisdom of crowds, right? But that's not exactly how you make a decision. Because especially in professional baseball, or in businesses in the on the edge, like you're, you're making by definition, outlier decisions every day, like they've never been made before. You, there's never been a driveline baseball, you know, before as it exists today, not even the driveline baseball of five months ago is the same business, right? Not, and the driveline baseball six months ahead will certainly not be the same business, right? And so it has to be come from first, what do you believe in? You know, what, what, what principles do you, does your business believe, you know, stand for? And which people, you know, do you really trust that have been around that have made decisions that make sense, you know, and they don't have to think like you, you ultimately don't want that, you know, but you do want, um, you don't want dissent just for dissent like purpose. I've gotten that criticism or that comment a few times from people where they're like, oh, well, you just hire everyone. The whole thing, everyone is data driven at your company. And that's, you know, what about this or what about that? You know, like why, you know, everyone believes in launch angle or fastball velocity or whatever. It's like, look, uh, that you, why don't you bring people in that have a different opinion? It's like, because man, you gotta have a, gotta have a stand. You gotta stand for what you believe in. There have to be first principles. It's like, and those are not derived arbitrarily, right? Like throwing hard is good. Swing the bat is good. Like not hitting the ball on the ground is good. Right. Like justifying the majority of our decisions using data is good. Right. And like maybe I'm wrong about some or all or none of those things. Right. But like they didn't they weren't they're not arbitrary decisions. Like they're just how that's our culture. It's how we go about things. It's it's how uh, it's how we succeed, you know. And so like that's that's the culture we need in here. But in that's inside that framework, you know, we're certainly welcome. We're, we're certainly open to certain ideas and a data driven model doesn't mean that you're a slave to the data, right? There's a, there are pictures out there that have great success, incredible success that over many years, over a large sample, I was just talking about one this morning that have TrackMan out like their pitch metrics and Arsenal scores that any sort of way to quantify it consistently rank in the bottom 20% uh, from a process oriented perspective. But then from an outcome perspective, you're just like, this guy just keeps getting outs and not just outs, but swing and misses and strikeouts. And it's just like, at some point you have to understand that like, we don't know enough about this game. Like it's a beautiful thing. Like, it's very, uh, it's very easy to believe that we know everything about the game. When you look at TrackMan and now Hawkeye data and all this other stuff, like we know, like uh, we know what creates outs. We know it creates nasty factor. We know it creates whatever, you know, and it's, I mean, people thought that 10 years ago, too, about well, before we even had pitch effects or 15 years ago when pitch effects wasn't even a thing. We thought we knew, too. You know, we thought we knew strikeouts are good, walks are bad, like hit the ball on the ground, you know, like tenants that have held up decently well, you know, but then, you know, there's just there's way more to it than that. And so in, in 15 years, a lot of the stuff that we believe now will be challenged. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just it's, it'll evolve. So I think I think that kind of that's kind of how, how I look at it. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned that Driveline is, is a very unique company, and, and uh, I think we should mention that your path to where you are now is also very unique. And it's not like you were following a blueprint, right? Like you weren't following in anyone else's footsteps. So I'm curious, who was it that you were looking up to uh, throughout your career, and, and who do you still look up to now? Yeah, I mean, um, when, I was, when I was starting to train players, you know, and starting to coach in high school and coaching Little League, you know, I was, I was trying to find a better way. Uh, I really, yeah, I looked up to scientists, you know, I looked up to, you know, physicists, experimental ones like Richard Feynman, uh, just like, yeah, in my econ, I was an, <clears throat> I was an economist, you know, that was, that's what I studied in college and what I did for years for, for a company like analyzing uh, risk and uh, game theory. Like I did a bunch of stuff for a, a poker site 
And uh, so fraudulent transactions, collusion, are they cheating? How do you know they're cheating without them saying I'm cheating in the chat log? Because they don't do that, right? Uh, we don't spy on them. So we don't know if they're using AOL and some messenger to relay. You know, how, how do you know? And so you have to develop not only algorithms, but a good feel like, you know, for, for the game, for gambling and so forth. And, and so then when I got to baseball, I just kind of took those principles. And I looked and I'm like, surely this must exist. And then looked around and found Moneyball. I read Moneyball and I'm like, this is super interesting, but literally doesn't talk at all about player development, which is what I'm interested in. And it actually makes fun of it. You know, they're just like, oh, yeah, Michael, Ta you know, like Tahada, like he always swings and misses. And Billy Bean just thinks that that can't be changed. It's like, is that true? Like, I don't know if that's true. Like, you know, and then, you know, later in the book, you're just like, what the heck? Like, what? It literally doesn't discuss that at all, that, that, that that's true or not, you know? Uh, and then I was on Michael Lewis's podcast. I was, you know, um, and it was, and we talked about it and I'm like, Michael, you know, like that's when he stood out and Michael's like, yeah, it never really made sense. He's like the whole thing. He's like, when I was writing the book, like they just never talked about player development or coaching, you know, he's like, it was crazy, you know? And, uh, so it was really funny to talk to him about it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so like it, it was really not much, not really too many people in baseball. Obviously I looked up to Billy and Theo Epstein and, you know, what, what was happening in the game, but I knew that I wasn't going to be smart enough and I was too late to probably make an impact on the analytical side. You know, um, at that time I wasn't a software developer. Uh, I was an economist and my modeling skills were in, in, in wildly different areas. Uh, so I was just like, I don't, you know, I, I don't pride myself on being very intelligent, you know? So it's like, I just, I see who's succeeding and I'm just like, I don't think this is going to, I don't think I'm going to be able to compete, you know, by the time I get ramped up. So like coaching was always, a, a, you know, something that was interesting to me. And then I looked at the strength and conditioning community, to be honest, for the coaches, you know, just like they, they are very data driven. You know, they're very muscle head nerds. You know, they calculate one rep maxes, like tonnage over six weeks, a macro cycle, a micro cycle, you know, how the comp super compensation, a dual factor model, a single factor model, right? Like, it's just like, for whatever you think of powerlifters, they're actually like incredibly intelligent you know, and, and detailed in their work. And so then that was, that was probably it. And then med medical research too, but there was very little, you know, out there, you know, until I ran into people like Trevor Bauer, who was then at UCLA. And I was like, this guy's doing something different. You know, that's interesting. And then Lincecum, you know, was in Seattle and I watched him pitch and I was like, uh, you know, no one's ever seen a pitcher like that. Like that's different. You know, and Lincecum changed the game forever for everyone. And, and, tre and Trevor benefited, you know, um, Sonny Gray benefited guys like that, you know? And so, I guess those are the things that really opened up my mind where it was just like, man, this is a, this is a different thing. There's a different way to look at it, you know? And I, I think that was it. You know, there were really no other people on the pitching side uh, that I, that I was like, that's, that's, that's it. You know, we're going to do that. Very cool. Um, okay. Well, you're a very busy person and you clearly have a lot um, on your plate. I'm curious how you go about managing your time day to day um, and like allotting time to make sure that you're progressing in, you know, the way that you want to in all these different areas of your life? Yeah, it's definitely, definitely very busy and uh, very lucky to be, have a partner, not only in my business, you know, but then also in my life, in my, in, in my, my, my wife, Astrid, who uh, is incredibly supportive. I mean, I really don't know why. <laughs> I certainly don't deserve it, you know, but uh, like, it, it's, it's, it's a blessing, you know, um, to have it, have those people in my life and that understand. Um, I've always historically been a pretty terrible manager of time. Like just, just awful. I would argue that I'm still pretty, well, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not going to say that I'm bad. I would say that I've improved significantly over the last two years by ne necessity. Um, but it's usually like the same thing. I learn lessons like probably a lot of, a lot of people do, you know, I just do the same thing and it fails a million times until I just can't take it anymore. And then I'm like, all right, when the, when the pain becomes too great, then I refactor my life, you know? And I think that really describes software development anyway. <laughs> so like, that's kind of, it's kind of how I, I feel about it. You know, like every day, anyone who's written code, including you probably, you know, you look at your code of a tool you wrote a year ago and you're like, that, that sucks. There's no way like, and then you're just like, I should fix it, but I'm not gonna, you know? And then finally, like, you know, the GD service on MLB changed the scheme of the database like one too many times. And you're just like, okay, fine. Like I'll do it. You know, so I've hired a personal, an executive assistant. Uh, you know, her name's Emily and she's great. You know, she does uh, everything. I trust her with my life, you know? So she helps me schedule things and uh, just like take care of my life and help me find things and take care of my finances. And we trust her implicitly. And 
she does a ton of stuff for driveline baseball now. You know, she's great. She lives in Kansas and, I can't say enough about it. Without Emily, oh man, it'd be no, no way, no way, you know. So, and I'm still learning to trust, not even trust her. Just like, how do I, how do I compartmentalize work so she can do it, you know, without setting her up to fail? And I'm still learning how to do that. You know, I'm, I'm actually getting coaching on how to do it. I'm getting executive coaching um, on how to let go of a few things. You know, I'm not, I'm not a control freak by nature, not at all. Uh, but it's, it's the things that you don't know that you can give up that kill you, you know, and like, that's, that's what the coaching is helping me, you know, realize how I can be better on that. So that's part of it. Um, I, I'm, I'm an effective worker. You know, I really believe, you know, I believe that per hour I get out a lot. If I can really focus um, and, and put my head down and put my earbuds in and work um, from an hour to hour output perspective, I, I, I'm up there with, with, with some pretty, pretty productive people. You know, I'm really good at, at getting the work done. I attribute that to having a liberal arts education, having a wide range of, in, of knowledge, um, just being a person that loves to read books and, and stay on top of knowledge. Um, I'm lucky in the fact that I enjoy learning. Uh, I know that that's not the case for a lot of people. Um, that doesn't make them stupid. That's a very common misconception, you know, that people that don't like learning are stupid. That's not true. Um, you know, it's lucky that if you enjoy to read and you enjoy learning, well, that's might be the greatest gift you can have, you know, as a person. And I just happen to have it. So when you have all that knowledge, it makes and, and all that intelligence boiled down, um, you know, it makes it makes the everyday task, the unknown easier because you can connect it. You know, your brain can connect a million different situations that are not related at all and turn it into what is really a neural net right into uh, a solution that you can see that maybe other people can't uh, right away anyway, you know, and so th that's a big part of it. And then I compartmentalize my time. Like these times, you know, I spend with my family. These times I work on red stuff. This time I work on, on driveline stuff and, and I'm a pretty good delegator, you know, of, of work. And then at the end of the day, I haven't worked fewer than 65 hours a week on average, uh, probably since I was, uh, 20, like, yeah, I, I was working full time when I was in college and I've pretty, pretty consistently had two jobs and then gone to school my whole life. And it's just, it's a skill. It's like anything else you learn how to work and, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty, pretty steady 80 hours a week, you know? Um, but it's really never been less than 60. That's for sure. And, uh, I just love working. I, I love working. I, I love doing it. I think it's important, you know, as you get older, you can't work as much. So got to get it, get it, get it done when you can. So that, that's how I feel. Okay, cool. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and that kind of connects to uh, something interesting that I kind of related to from the watch momentum YouTube video about your life, the kind of biography um, that came out uh, in the past. And it was very interesting. But um, one thing that your a high school teacher of yours said was that you're, you're, you were always very laser focused on things that you were interested in but not really as focused on things that you weren't interested in, which um, it, that's kind of a criticism that I've gotten um, in my educational career as well. So it kind of touched a nerve, but um, is that something that's still the case for you? And how have you dealt with having to do things that you weren't interested in throughout your career, which I'm sure you had to do from time to time? Yeah, it, it's tough. You know, it's still the case for me. Um, yeah, there's just some things you got to learn, you know, that you're never going to be interested in probably. And uh, it just doesn't matter. Like you got to knock them out. Like there's things you got to do, you know, hopefully as you grow a business or you grow an organization, you can find people who are interested in those things, you know, and then you, you fit it together like a puzzle piece, right? Like, oh, you're not interested in this. Well, I am. And I'm not interested in this, but you are. So it's like, that's how we should, you know find a union of people, right? And that, and that's the whole idea of finding people that are different from you, you know, and they're going to come not only with that, it's not like, oh, here's the same person as me, but he likes to do taxes and, and like look at uh, human resources stuff and legal compliance. And uh, Kyle likes to do, and then I like to do strategy and I like to do, you know, the fun stuff and write the software, you know, it's like, that, that's not how it works. Like the, the person who like likes doing that has a very different personality and a very different background. And that's, um, that's good. Like it's a good thing. Know, uh, so you gotta you gotta get used to it, and so you know. But but at the beginning, you just you gotta understand that like suffering is part of it. You know, and it's just gratitude in a lot of ways of understanding. You know, the, the old cliche of like we could have it so much worse. You know, like in my case, like just extraordinarily lucky to be born at the time I was. You know, I got to grow up with the internet. 
you know, um, let's see the birth of the internet, man. Like I, I, I like that's, man, what a, what a gift, you know, my, and my parents invested in a computer, uh, when I was young, you know, and computers were insanely expensive, you know, and I grew up in a below average income family and I was on Apple two E's growing up right in command line basic, um, you know, and then, and my parents, when I was, you know, 14 or so, or, you know, something like that invested in, uh, 13 invested in, a you know, Pentium 100 megahertz computer probably cost them like 2000 bucks, you know, and that, that was our entire Christmas gift to the family, you know, um, it was well worth it. I mean, it's just like, you know, like what, how lucky are you that you, you get to do that kind of stuff, you know? And so for part of it, it's like, you know, I've been so lucky in my whole life to be born to a father who worked at NASA, you know, who then gave up his job at NASA because it was too demanding. So he could raise kids like, you know, that, that's, that's lucky. You know, he went on to be an engineer at British petroleum, you know, and then at a newspaper and, uh, was a blue collar guy, you know, and just worked his ass off and set a good example. You know, he was always home at a certain time, set standards for discipline, never wavered, you know, but was fair, was extremely fair. Um, he was tough, but extreme, but fair. Uh, he was very tough, you know, but he was very fair. At no point did I ever feel like I was being treated unfairly. You know, maybe I did at the time, you know, but like <laughs> looking back, no, you know, my mother was, was very tough too, you know, and they placed a huge, um, huge, Emphasis on education, you know, and I went to public schools after, uh, after primary school, you know, and, uh, and that's lucky too, because you get a, you get a huge amount of, uh, of spectrum of understanding that goes beyond the books, you know, and that's why public school is, is important to me. My kids are in public school. I believe in it hundred percent, um, because it's not about what you learn. You know, we can always teach you math. I can always teach you learning, you can, or, or reading or whatever. You can always learn subject stuff. We have Google. I mean, you can learn stuff. You know, but like, can you learn perspectives and, and meet with diverse people and, you know, um, and then that'll serve you really well later in life. And so for me, yeah, like Dr. Jekyll, uh, sorry, Mr. Jekyll uh, was, uh, is my favorite teacher, but he was also my advisor in academic decathlon, science Olympiad, and he had a hell of a time keeping me focused um, and he challenged me, you know, and he, you know, he knew that at the time that it was going to be hard to keep me focused, but he kept saying later in life, like, it's going to be important. Like it, it, it's, it's a play. It, it sh you should be so lucky. He didn't say this, but this is how I feel. It's like, you know, you work a hundred hour work week and you're exhausted at the end of the day, you know, and you work two jobs to make ends meet and you, and, but you're like, get to study what you want to study. You get to work as hard as you possibly can. And no one can take that opportunity away from you. And it's like, it's pretty lucky to have that, you know, like to be in America, to be in a country when you can work as many hours as you want and, and eat what you kill is an incredible opportunity that a lot of the world doesn't have, you know, and then now with the birthplace of the internet and with COVID turning into a positive, a lot of the jobs are virtual now. So you can work as much as you want, you know, and I'm, I know I've been ranting, but the big thing I learned from being a professional gambler, and this is what it really taught me is that every minute you sleep or you don't research, you know, or you screw around, you know, or you enjoy leisure time, people are earning money. Like online poker is going 24 seven, 365 games in real life are going every day, blackjack poker. You know, there are games to be beat everywhere. Like I beat blackjack. I beat poker. You know, there are games you can beat like in everywhere, you know, and it's just like every minute you don't spend making money is that opportunity going away from you, you know? So how do you divvy your time between working as hard as you can, earning as much as you can while not going nuts? And so then when that opportunity was taken away from me with the unlawful internet gambling enforcement act, I learned a lesson very quickly that like, I, I, uh, I just didn't, I didn't appreciate the opportunity I did have and I was never going to make that mistake again. So when I realized that being able to work incredibly hard was not a challenge, but an opportunity and it had to be taken away from me in a very violent way. Um, I'll never give that up. And so it was a good lesson to learn. It was, I was lucky, very lucky to learn that lesson. A hard way, but very lucky. Yeah, very cool. Very interesting. I'm curious about whether you would describe yourself as a people person and, and kind of what that means to you, um, whether you are or not. Um, I like to think so. You know, um, I always think about one singular event in my life. I think if you knew me when I was 12 years old, and then never saw me again. And then now you'd be like, what, the, you know, like, how is Kyle this person, you know? Um, and then the reason is, is like, I went to Catholic school. 
uh, grew up with a large family. I was pretty insular, you know, pretty shy kid, uh, really awkward. And then by the, and then when I got to high school, I switched to public school. And with that came a much different group of people, you know, and different education levels, different backgrounds, different family backgrounds, different religious beliefs. And then in doing so, I had to, you yeah, had two options. That's how I felt. You know, I went to a public school where none of my friends in Catholic school went to. So I had no friends at the school. Um, so you kind of have two choices. You know, you just live that life and you're a loner, you know, or you reach out on a branch and it's terrifying. And you overhear two kids talking about X-Wing versus TIE Fighter and study hall. And you're like, I, I like that game. And then you try to connect with them and it's scary as hell. And uh, then those two people, you know, become your friends in high school and then, you know, then slowly you branch out and then you, that's a skill that you learn, you know? So that, yeah, I think uh, I've become one over, over the years. Yeah, for sure. I've become one for sure. So shout outs to Jim Bradford, Tom Ritzert, if they watch this, <laughs> that uh, we're still really close today that, uh, that like helped me bring me along and, and realize that. So yeah. Yeah. I think it's a really important skill to have, you know? Cool. And um, another thing that, um, I kind of am getting from you and that I think everyone knows is that you're a very competitive person. Um, is that, or, or I guess I should just leave it open-ended. Um, what drives that competition for you and, and basically why are you that way? Yeah, I didn't used to be a good competitor. I mean, actually for most of my life, I wasn't, <clears throat> you know, through high school, I was not, um, not that competitive. The best trying to say as concisely as possible. You know, I did competitive things. I played soccer played baseball, you know, tennis was probably my main sport. Uh, but I, I played them to enjoy them, you know, and then I played Magic the Gathering and I've won, you know, a Star City Games Open, you know, $5,000 tournament, big, you know, they're big tournaments. And I've, I've won, you know, and I've, I've played competitive Magic and, and like chess. I was a pretty competitive chess player when I was younger. Um, but I was not a good competitor, uh, you know, in, in gambling, you're always competing. You know, that taught me a lot. Um, that taught me how to compete uh, a ton, you know. And so I think it was it was gambling that changed a lot of my life, you know, because you realize gambling is a zero sum game. You know, it's actually negative sum because the casino charges you a fee to, to do your to do your job. Right. So you realize that every dollar you get comes from somewhere. Right. Whether it's the casino, if you're playing blackjack or it comes from a player, if they're playing poker. Right. And so then the two skills you learn quickly if you're playing poker or blackjack too before you get banned from playing blackjack are two things. One, you have to be a people person. Like people don't want to hand money over to a nerd who has headphones in and doesn't keep the game going and doesn't like cultivate the game. You know, this is something a lot of people didn't understand in their early 20s when gambling was really, really popular 16 years ago. And it was free money everywhere. They're like, it's never going to end. Like there's just tons of money. Who cares? Like cares if you're a jerk at the table, right? Like who cares if you, why do you have to build relationships with these people? They're idiots. We're taking their money. Suddenly, you know, a decade later, we now know like, Hey, like people don't like losing money over a decade to, to people who are jerks, you know? So you have to like actually develop a decent relationship with them. And then all the big money's in private games. How do you get invited to a private game? Well, not being a jerk and like winning all the money all the time and not providing anything. Like, why would they bring you there? You know, like they're trying to escape their job as a hedge fund manager, as a business magnate, you know, they, they want to have fun, right? How do you become a people person, right? How do you like provide a service, you know, and also like have positive expectation of money, right? And then the second side of that is competing. How do you compete under that framework? You know, how do you maximize your earnings? You know, how do you take from other people, you know, and how do you do that? And um, it was professional gambling that taught me how to compete. Um, and it taught me, the value of competing in business, you know, and then it just transferred over to business. I read Mark Cuban's how to win book, which is really a collection of his blog posts on blogmaverick.com. Uh, but it's three bucks. It's great, great buy. I'm sure it's probably like a dollar now it might be free, you know, and uh, it just talks a lot about how he can, how he thinks about competition from sports to business. And uh, while there's nothing in the book that you're going to be like, Oh man, like that makes sense. You know, and I'm sure Mark wouldn't say that either. You know, like just reading it, it's like, oh, there, there is a direct parallel to how we compete in life and how we do anything is how we do everything. And so it was a natural transition to business once I got the right perspective. Very cool. All right. I'm going to switch a little uh, switch up a little bit to a baseball question. Um, there's been a little bit of talk of potentially moving the mound back. Um, I don't know if that's actually going to happen or not, but the idea is that if the mound was further back, 
there would be fewer strikeouts, fewer home runs, and the style of play might be a little bit more contact oriented, which the league might prefer uh, stylistically. But my question to you is from a you know director of pitching point of view, you have all these pitchers who would have to make a big adjustment very quickly. So if that rule was to go into effect, into effect, say like next year, how would you go about um, preparing for that change? Yeah, it's an, I've, it's an interesting one. I've thought about it. It's been, it's been suggested they were going to do it in the Atlantic league. The players rebelled uh, perhaps quite rightly. Uh, it's, it's also, it's also unfortunate that they rebelled because it's like, you know, to really learn the effects of it, we have to do it. You know, we don't, we just don't know. It's like lowering the mound, you know, in when Bip Bob Gibson dominated that year, you know, it's like, you know, we, we probably know that that would be bad now. Like if we lowered the mound now, I think it would be worse for the hitters, you know, because like the way the game's going right with flat fastballs that have high spin, mm-hmm. like you're going to lower the vertical approach angle uh, of, of, high spin fastballs and like that's gonna be bad for hitters in the short term you know <laughs> like because the game was dominated by tall sinker ballers and so then reducing the vertical approach angle which is what happens when you lower the mound obviously is was good right like uh, sinkers and, and sharp breaking balls and all that benefit from a, a steep attack angle or you know ver- vertical approach which is really just the pitcher's attack angle we should call it that but whatever um and uh you know, so like, but like moving the mound back has two effects. One, it like combats, it theoretically combats the velocity um, increases in the game. Um, more on that in a second. I don't necessarily believe that's true, right? Two, what it also does is provide longer ball flight, right? Um, which is related to one, but is different in a way that I don't think people are thinking about, um, which I think would be apparent if you played catch from 60 feet, play catch with someone from 30 feet who has a 70 grade slider in the big leagues, right? Like, for example, I can go play catch with Carter Cass, you know, who works here, right? And from 30 feet, he can throw sliders, whatever, or from 40 feet or whatever, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't break, right? It spins, no big deal, you know? Play catch from 60 feet, and then you're reminded very quickly why Carter Caps was one of the best pitchers in the big leagues very fast, you know? Play catch from 70 feet, and you're going to be terrified because the ball has, you know, 10 more feet to break. Right. And then the total break length and the break angle will increase. Right. Because of two factors. One, there's Magnus, obviously. Right. And then that and the trajectory of the ball has a longer path to to break. Right. Yes. But only the recently understood phenomenon and not seam shifted weight. This is not this part of it, although this may have an effect and I don't know the effect of that. Right. I don't think anyone does. But the second fact is generally understood, but not widely understood which is that if, especially with you throw a pitch with high gyro component, so say a sinker or a slider, probably more apt, apt in this case, um, as you throw a pitch that has high gyro component, if it is thrown on a lateral, the more lateral of a trajectory it is thrown on, the more in flight the spin efficiency changes, right? Because so you can throw a pitch with 0% spin efficiency, aka a perfect gyro ball, but if it's thrown right to left as a right-handed pitcher and the more it's thrown crossbody and the more it's thrown to your glove side, it then changes orientation and flight purely due to the trajectory, right? And then so this is the phenomenon of late break, right? So for decades, well, for centuries, people were like, oh, there's late break to this person, whatever, and then culminating in Mario Rivera, like this cutter has late break to then like 15 to 20 years. Of, there's no such thing as late break. That doesn't make any sense. Like plug it into a nine parameter model with Magnus. You can obviously tell that late break makes no sense. You plot it using the formulas that we have. And it's like, no, look, it's like a steady break. To the hitter, it's just like, that's not what it looks like, but okay, maybe it's an optical illusion. To then realizing that Marion Rivera's cutter has a huge amount of gyro spin, and on the way to the plate, it changes, its, its axis changes in flight, right? And then so it probably does break more as it gets late to the plate, right? Compounded by the fact that it's slower at the end of the plate, and then the slower it is, the more time it has to change, right? And so... I got a feeling that, you know, we're only going to know the answer if we do it, but I got a feeling if we move the mound back substantially and significantly, even if it's a small change, that there will be more walks and more strikeouts and more pitches thrown per at bat. Uh, I don't think velocity is the issue. It's certainly not comfortable, but pitchers are not gaining velocity anymore. Like over the last few years, it's really leveled off. And I think that will probably be the case, you know, and then, the hitters are succeeding against velocity. Just look into the X-Woba against. Look at the run value per pitch. Like, 
97 down the middle 10 years ago had a run value per pitch of being like a probably a 70 grade pitch. Today, if you throw 97 down the middle with average movement, like you'll be out of the league very fast. You know, like it just doesn't have positive run value anymore. So it's evidence that the play, that the, the hitters are rapidly adapting to velocity, but not breaking balls. And if you make breaking balls artificially better, I got a bad feeling about it. Like, you know, I got a bad feeling that hitters are going to strike out more and then you change the pitcher's release point and angle and then they're going to walk more batters too. So only way to know is to do it, but I really don't – I would be shocked if it helped the batters. I would be shocked. All right. I hope Rob Manfred's listening because that was a great uh, great argument to, to not do that <laughs> under any circumstance. So, um, cool. All right. Well, now we're going to do three quick hits, just kind of like some quick questions, quick answers. Um, and the first one touches on something you just talked about. Um, I'm asking you, what do you think is the upper limit for fastball velocity, um, like physically possible? And do you think that's going to continue to – um, increase over the next 10 to 15 years like it kind of has been um, for the you know previous decade or so? Yeah, I've kind of maintained that I think that the upper limit of velocity is going to be pretty much where it is, you know, in the 100, 400, 5 range. Uh, I don't know, you know, like obviously Roldis Chapman is like probably the best person you can choose for this. You're going to need like to, to break the 105 mile an hour barrier substantially. You know, you're going to need um, you're going to need someone with like a build like that, you know, who's a genetic freak. Right. Incredible athlete. And then it's also extremely mechanically efficient, which Chapman is, you know, and then uh, trains extremely hard, which Chapman does. You know, he optimizes for velocity. Um, so there's just not a lot of headroom. There, you know, like, it's just not like. If it was like someone that was six one that threw like 105 miles an hour, you know, and it would just be like, oh, okay, like it's pretty obvious where the gains are here, you know. We just need someone that's six seven, you know, that's like, you know, incredibly like the fastest runner ever or whatever. And then like from a young age, teach him to throw. And if that ever happens, like, hey, look at this, like this guy throws 110, you know. But the fact that our oldest Chapman has the fastest thrown fastball does not bode well for breaking the like the upper limit, you know, because it's like ah, geez, like it's hard to hard to imagine someone that's a better athlete and a better like person who optimized for velocity than Chapman. So it's definitely, it'll, it'll be broken. Right. For sure. Right. But, but substantial, like it may take some time. And even if it doesn't, I don't think it's going to go to like above 110 or anything like that. You know, I'd love to be wrong. I'd love for this to be quoted by freezing cold takes in 10 years. And uh, that's not right. You know, but um, I don't know, but like the, the floor is just higher every year, like every year. Yeah. Yeah. If you're 25 and you're right-handed and you come out of a bullpen, like, it's like, oh, I wonder how hard this guy throws. It's like, no, you don't. Like, you, you know how hard he throws. Like, well, you know how you know how hard he doesn't throw. Like, he doesn't throw 90. Like, he, he probably he throws anywhere from 95 to 100, right? And then the worst case scenario is if it's a rookie that comes out of the pen and he's right-handed and he does throw 92. It's like, that's awful because then you know the breaking ball is unhittable. Like, then you know the other stuff is, 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 is gross. So, yeah, the floor is just going to continue to grow would be my guess. Okay. That makes more sense that the floor would be growing rather than everyone just getting the same boost and the ceiling keep, you know, continues to get broken um, to me. Okay. So number two, question number two, um, what is one of your favorite quotes? Yeah, it's the, the W. Daniel Hillis quote. It's by far my favorite about Richard Feynman. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, I can, I, I've said it a million times. I stared at it on my wall in the old driveline. We had it on the wall. So, oh, yeah. uh, and it's a, uh, Richard Feynman is dying of cancer and uh, he, at the end of his life, he decides to become basically an intern for W. Daniel Hillis, who was an extremely smart, still is uh, the four, four, you know, forefather of digital physics and neural networks and, and computing and things like that, you know, and decided to research some stuff. And so the, one of the things they worked on is um, yeah, this is not necessarily, to the, necessarily for the quote, but I, it's a great story. And one of the things they worked on was, um, evolutionary biology and like uh, evolutionary uh, fitness of genetic algorithms, you know, this is decades ago, right? So this is something like today that you can see on a YouTube channel, but now is like, was, was pretty new, right? And so then the, the, the assumed idea, like using Darwinian evolution in a lot of ways, or like looking at Lamarckian evolution, right? It's just like over time that like uh, some the fitness functions of a species like grow in a very linear rate, right? And it's just like, oh, like they learn to walk and then they learn to walk faster and then they learn to walk fat, right? It's just like, like that can be the, that's, that's really the myth that people sell themselves to. Um, but in reality, if you look at like evolution, that's, that's not how it works, right? Like, it's like 
thousands and millions of years of no change. And then like a step function of like, now this bird can fly. It's like, what the, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. how was that? How did that happen? You know? And it's like, well, like enough mutations and accidental things happen. Right? And then it's like, oh, well, flying is good. So then that bird like had a bunch of, you know, offspring and then they fly, you know, and it's like, oh, so it's a step function. It's not a linear thing. Right. And so then, uh, but it's not always taught that way. It's taught like evolution is like this, right? And it's, it is in a trend line, but not actually, right? Observed, it's not. And uh, so then I say all that, uh, it's a cool phenomenon. Uh, but then he basically applied that theory to like uh, genetic algorithms when it comes to computers and like digital physics and, and neural networks, right? Which is like, we should not expect an algorithm to converge on the local maxima of, of like, uh, of this, you know, uh, of the data like what is the best fitness function or like what is the best representation or what is the, the the highest fitness like we can get out of this algorithm over x amount of time and remember the computers are like orders of magnitude slower than they are today right and so it's, it's like we should expect hours days of no change right and then like is the computer working like is this a waste of time right and then you should see steps right and that's how he describes this and then richard is like yeah i mean that, that makes sense right and then uh, they do it, and then it, it turns out that they're right, right? And then, like, Hill is super excited. He feels like he found something. And then he, like, goes to the library, and he was just reading something. And it turns out, like, just some dude wrote about it, like, five years prior to that. And it was, like, in the first chapter. It was, like, not even novel. And Hillis is like, oh, my God. Like, what the? Like, it, was, it wasn't even interesting. And then Feynman's like, no, man. Like, isn't that cool that, like, we also derived it? You know, we had nothing. We had no idea that we derived it as well. Isn't that the, the learning? The pleasure is in the learning, right? Not in the not in the finding of something novel. And then he basically drops the quote, which is uh, in everything that we did. Hillis is talking about Feynman. He's just like everything that we did. Or Feynman says, not bad for a pair of amateurs, right? And then Hillis says, like in everything, he's like, I realized then that in everything that we did, we were amateurs. Neural networks, digital physics, genetic algorithms. You know, like we didn't know anything, but no one else knew anything either, right? And so it is amateurs who drive the progress in, in society and in things. And it's the thing we had up in R&D at Driveline. We'll have it again here in the new one. And it's something I remind people. It's just like, this is where we are going are areas that no one knows anything about. And by definition, it will be the amateurs that solve it. So it might as well be us. So it, it's, it's very exciting. It, it, I really love the quote. I think it sums up who we are. Awesome. I love it. I'm going to touch back on that um, with my last question, but... Um, this one's a little bit different. It's the third quick hit. Um, what's something that you're looking forward to like right now? Man, a lot. Uh, one thing I'm looking forward to is, um, post estimation data. Um, let me see how, 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 how I want to say this. Uh, Hawkeye is installed in all, all the major league parks, uh, and in the majority of them, if not all, I really don't know the answer to this question. I'm not hiding it. Or like in eventually Hawkeye will be installed. Eventually Hawkeye will have pose estimation data for pitchers in all the parks that is uh, available. Right. Um, I don't know if that is next year or two years from now or whatever. And it will be at a sufficient, sufficiently high frame rate to capture rudimentary biomechanics of pitchers and hitters, right? Um, we are still so early in that process and the data is so noisy and we don't really know where we're going. It's the first year of Hawkeye, right? And just like the first year of TrackMan, there were a ton of problems, right? Um, but imagine having, you know, markerless pose estimation data at a high enough frame rate of every pitcher and hitter and runner and fielder too, right? But, you know, being selfish. I don't really care about the pictures yeah. uh, for years. Like the data, the longitudinal data set that will come out of that and, and what you'll find and, and markerless data has a million problems, right? Like angular velocities aren't accurate, right? But like you just even having planar kinematics, like stride length deflection and arm angle at foot contact and all that, like having all that information in an in a easily queryable database or data set or whatever the representation will be may change the game forever, you know, and that is what I'm looking forward to because it's like, man, that, that is the next, that is the next pitch effects. Like when pitch effects first debuted, I will be the first to admit that I read Dan Fox's articles on baseball perspectives. Who's currently, I think the director of baseball informatics of the pirates still. Uh, so I read Dan Fox's original articles about pitch effects. And I was like, who, who cares? Like, no one is going to care about this. This is ridiculous. Like, these graphs are absurd. Like, they're stupid. 
there's a ton of error. Who cares? You know, then it took until Josh Kalk wrote about it for me to be like, I'm an idiot. Like uh, Josh is correct. And then I employed Josh for a short period of time. It's my claim to fame. Uh, and uh, then I realized very quickly, and then that will happen with post estimation data. It will be a step function in what is required not only from an analytics perspective, but from a coach perspective. At some, if, if you're a coach out there in high school, college, or pro, and you want to move up and you aren't thinking about how to interpret biomechanical data, whether it's marker based or marker list or post estimation or however dirty, if you're not thinking about it, you will be left behind fast. Like it will be important soon to know that. Um, so it's very exciting for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I share your excitement with that um, as well. Getting to work with that data set eventually is one of the main reasons why as an analyst, I'm excited about working for a team eventually. And that's why that's something that I want to do is because that, that's who's going to have this data set. Um, and there's so many gains to be made there um, in the next five or 10 years that I feel like whichever team is doing that the best is going to have a huge competitive advantage for a long time. So, um, well, my last question was going to be, um, what's the next frontier in player development? I think you totally covered that um, with that question, but um, is there something else that um, outside of Hawkeye that maybe we should be kind of setting our sights on? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think that's really interesting uh, technology. Um, yeah. I don't think that's the next frontier though. You know, I, I, we're going to, we're going to get a huge amount of performance increase from it. And no, no questions. So I'm not trying to minimize what I just said. Um, you know, but the next frontier is uh, we really, we really, um, like internet international scouting um, is like, and just amateur scouting, I think too, but really international scouting and player development is so in its infancy, like just so, so early, you know, like we're, we're so early on finding the best talent in the world that can throw baseballs, you know? And like, there's just so many unexplored areas that, that, I don't, I don't know. People just really haven't looked into, you know, it's like, and the reason why is that the, the talent in the big leagues every year is just, it's a joke how good it is. Like every year you're watching Ronald Acuna, you're watching the Ozzy Albies, you're watching, you got people got to see it with the Reds, Jose Garcia plays shortstop. And like, that kid's never played above a ball. He looks like that, you know, in the field, it's like, it's crazy. Right. Or, you know, 19 year olds pitching for the Padres or Andres Munoz. Right. Or like, it's like, man, and you know, it's, it's not even to name, all international players, you know, it's not even that, right. That just happens. Those came to mind. Right. And um, you just watch it and you're just like, good God, man, like the, the, the talent that's coming up, you'd have to be blind to see how crazy it is, how good these players are at such a young age, you know, um, the last, like, you know, like those are the things I think about. Like I think about like in Seattle when like Felix Hernandez debuted, you know, in a year, if you're watching Felix, you're like, this is unbelievable. Like there's a player this good at 20, you know, like, that's insane, you know, and like, and then there's more of that. Not as, not, not as good as Felix, right? But they're pretty darn good, you know. And so to watch it is just like really awesome. And so then it can become, you can become a complacent, right? Like, we are doing a good job. We are finding the best players in the world. We are like, find, you know, drafting the best talent and getting them up there. And you know, I don't think it's true. Like, I, and maybe it is, but I don't, I don't believe so. I don't believe we know, you know. So like, are are we first? The, the easy questions are like, are we getting all the best players out of the Dominican Republic? You know, like, is that true? Like, uh, like, is that actually true? I don't know. I, I don't know that that's true. Like, are we getting the best players out of Venezuela? I don't know. You know, like, are we getting the best players out of Colombia, Brazil? You know, players that we do have in America, you know, Korea, Taiwan, and Japan, right? Like, Australia, right? Like, those, and those are areas with comparably high populations of baseball players, right? And, and so I think we have a ton of gold to mine there, right? But then think, like, if you watch the Olympics – and you watch the obscure games like European handball, and you watch these guys that are like 6'5", like 265, with ridiculously long arms, and they are jacked. And they throw these, like, they throw handball, they throw volleyballs effectively, right, like at absurd speeds. And you just watch it, and you're like, there's just no way that guy can't throw 100. Like, right now, like, right now. Like, he probably could. You know, like, would it be good for his arm? Probably not, right? But, like... If you had to throw, if you told me you give him a million dollars, if he could throw a ball hundred miles an hour over the plate, I bet like within 10 pitches, he could get it done. You know, and it's just like, man, like who's thinking about that? Like who's thinking about like European Olympians and 10th tier sports? Like I am, I don't think too many other people are, you know, and like, 
it's just interesting. Like growing the game in Europe, I think can go a long way. Growing the game in greater Asia continent can go a long way. Like Russia has a, an, an insane amount of people in it. You can tell me that there's just no baseball players, no athletes good enough to throw a ball in Russia. You know, it's just like, no, nah, it's just, we haven't had to, don't care to, right. Whatever. Right. Uh, you know, like Indian cricket players, English cricket players, right. There's just like a ton, New Zealand, Australia. I don't know. Like for me, I would be very, I just don't feel like we are anywhere close to exploring the edges of who the best baseball players could be in this world. Um, and because we've had insufficient stimulus to do it. Right. And uh, maybe we will over the next decade or so with the changes that are coming down the pike in the minor leagues. But I think it's a huge thing. And I think, and I think it will also dovetail very well with the commissioner's goal of growing this game internationally it is getting people from underrepresented populations and under underrepresented backgrounds into major league, minor league and major league baseball will only help our game like internationally and represents a competitive edge for a team. Um, I've mentioned this to about 15 teams and they all think I'm an idiot. So uh, I have no fear of disclosing it. <laughs> so uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I, th I think it's a really interesting point. Very cool. I love it. I love it. Um, all right, Kyle. Well, that's all I have for you. Um, do you have anything else that you want to mention before we say goodbye here? No, I think it was a super comprehensive. Thanks for getting it. Uh, thanks for doing it. And, you know, we're excited with the Reds for this year and at driveline. Um, you know, been a, been a challenging year, but uh, we hope that everyone pays attention to our minor league guys, our non-drafted free agents, because uh, I think we're really excited about the crop of guys that we brought in and, and some, some prospects, you know, that are under the radar that might pop up. So, you know, stay tuned to that. And I think it's going to happen across baseball. No question. Um, but I think our team, uh, I think our team especially. So we're really excited. All right, Kyle. Well, thank you very much.